It, I suspect there are many, many times there were beneficiaries of intervention by angels that we're not even aware of. And we become aware of that only by really studying and realizing what God is doing and understand his purposes. Now, the characteristics of angels. Angels are not abstractions or concepts. They are actual personal beings. What do I mean by that? They have intellect, we learn from Matthew 28 and 1 Peter 1. Uh, they have emotions. They care. In Job 38 and Luke 2 and 15, we find references to that. They have will. They make choices. They can make bad choices, and we'll discover the, the results of some of the angels' bad choices as we mature in the, in the study a little further. And so, not only are they personal, but they're also spirit beings. What do I mean by that? They are not limited to material bodies. They are distinctive in that they can materialize, but um, they also are not limited to what we would consider a material body. They can only be in one place at one time. They're not ubiquitous. They're not like God who can be everywhere. They have locality, and they can only be in one place at one time. We learn from several passages. They appear, when we see them, they usually appear in the form of men. We don't see any case where they appear as a woman, despite the use of that idiom in literature and so forth. They always appear in the form of men, sometimes in natural sight with uh, human functions. In Genesis 18, we see that, and, uh, and the chapter following, chapter 19. Sometimes the angels are seen by some and not others. And we, uh, we saw an ex uh, example of that in 2 Kings 6 and so forth. We do know they do not reproduce, nor do they die. They can engage in reproductive mischief, and we'll talk about some specific cases of that from the biblical text as we go. Now, they do have physical reality. We need to understand that. They lead people by the hand in Genesis 19. They actually indulge in combat. And there's a rather remarkable case of that in 2 Kings 19. Let's take a look at it here. Where they slaughtered 185,000 Syrians. In 2 Kings chapter 19, in verse 35, it indicates that it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians, 104 score and 5 is the old English way of what we would say today of 185,000. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So this was a serious assault. In fact, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, never after that ever attacked Jerusalem again. He was under the unique protection, and uh, uh, that was a, a, a major event in that adversary. And so Sennacherib never again uh, undertook an invasion of Jerusalem. They had previously wiped out the northern kingdom, but in going against the southern kingdom, uh, God, pr God protected them. We're advised in the New Testament, many of us have entertained angels unawares. That's a very strange idea, but it's in Hebrews 13 too, where Paul tells us, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Strange idea. Not only can they appear as people, we could mistake them as people. They're able to do that. That's a capability they have. And... Uh, that may be strange in the absence of the background we gave you in the first session, but we'll keep moving here. And uh, angels have attributes in a degree greater than man, but less than God. We make mistakes both ways. Um, they have more knowledge than man, but less than God. And they have more power than man, but less than God. So it's, uh, on the one hand, we need to understand their reality, but we also need to be sensitive to their limitations. And... Uh, Angels are organized. They're not random individuals on assignments. They are ranked and organized. One, there's one archangel. We use the term archangel. There's actually one. His name happens to be Michael. And he's named in, in uh, Jude 9, and he shows up in Paul's letters also. And uh, there are also chief princes. In other words, in some sense, some are more senior than others. We'll explore a reference to that when we get into Daniel chapter 10. And uh, there's a certain kind of angel that we call a cherubim. In the Hebrew, I think it's cherubim. It's, a, it's, it's got a, a, a hard C, but we have a tendency to take the CH softly. The cherubim. A cherub is singular, 
cherubim is the plural. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a cherub, biblically, is not a little plump baby with wings, as is so often characterized in Renaissance art. That's a literary fiction concept that uh, it is, it is, it's, couldn't be more distant. Uh, uh, it wouldn't be possibly be more distant than that, uh, the reality is. And, and in fact, uh, cherubim are assigned to guard the way to the tree of life when Adam is kicked out of the Garden of Eden. So there's something very powerful and very fundamental about the cherubim. Uh, and uh, in fact, one of the cherubim, one of the cherubs, was in charge of all the rest and got carried away on an ego trip. And we know that one as Satan, and he'll be a, a special focus of our study, of course, as we go on here. We also encounter, especially in the book of Isaiah, in fact, only in this book of Isaiah, a, a, uh, a flaming one of some kind called a seraphim. And the very uh, uh, word implies a source of light, a, 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 like he's a, a, a source of brightness. And he, he, we encounter him in Isaiah 6. It's the only place we do. But I, I'll show you why I think that's synonymous with the creatures that we see in Revelation 4. In Revelation 4, we find some living creatures described that appear to be very much identical with what Isaiah called seraphim in Isaiah 6. And so we'll be looking at these more carefully. The major players, of course, there's the first major player I want to talk about is a source of a lot of confusion. Frequently in the Old Testament, we read of the angel of the Lord. And most scholars infer from what we know about them that those references are not angel in the diminutive sense, but it's an idiom of an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ before his incarnation. Um, when you don't really understand something, you give it a fancy name. So scholars call those theophanies or Christophanies. In other words, it's an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. Before Bethlehem, before he became a man and dwelt among us, he was able to appear and uh, participate in a number of events. And that when he does so, uh, the term that we find in the text has been translated the angel of the Lord. I want to emphasize that because what we know about him, it goes far beyond what we usually find out about angels. And so we'll call the, the theophanies are in a special category, if you will. And, uh, but in the realm of angels, as we think of angels, Gabriel is one of the most frequently encountered guys. And we, as we study his uh, assignments and his actions, we discover by inference that he appears to be primarily a, a messianic messenger. He's usually announcing something that has something directly to do with the advent of the Messiah, the, the Christ, if you will, uh, in the Old Testament and the New. That seems to be his, his main job. Another angel that has a name, and apparently a, a, we can infer his job description, is a guy by the name of Michael. And uh, he is clearly a military leader on behalf of Israel. All his assignments are directly labeled in, in, in those terms. We're going to explore these senior ranks of angels, cherubim, seraphim, and so forth as a group. Um, we're going to discover that they have four faces. And those four faces are in common to each category, strangely enough. And there's something very uh, peculiar about th that insignia, those four faces that we associate with the cherubim. One of those cherubim turned bad got an ego trip and wanted to be equal to God. And, and uh, he had a career that we're going to explore especially. He goes by the name of Lucifer or more commonly Satan. He is designated in the text that at one time he was the cherub that covereth. In other words, the one in charge. And it's from there that he got into trouble and he took some lieutenants with him. We're going to talk about Abaddon and Apollyon, which are terms that mean the destroyer. And uh, we'll also talk about Gog, the king of the locusts, and uh, what, are th what is all that about. And we'll discover they are apparently some of his senior lieutenants under him, but perhaps a notch more powerful than the rest. We will we'll learn that about a third of the angels uh, were involved in that conspiracy that caused them uh, to get cast out. So 
We're also going to explore a creature that we call demons, and we're going to discover that demons are different than angels. Angels and demons appear to have different limitations, different characteristics, and we'll be exploring all of those. In fact, we'll devote our next session to that.